Hey, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Title of our show at this point uh, here on Community Matters is Ocean Bottom Research in the Time of the COVID. Is that complex enough? And uh, this is Melody Lindsay. Hi, Melody. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Jay. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. You're more than just a PhD. You're a PhD actively involved in postdoc research. So what was the subject of your PhD and what is the subject of your postdoc research? So my, my PhD, I just graduated um, oh, just about a year ago at this point from Montana State University. And uh, at Montana State, I uh, was working on uh, investigating the metabolisms of microorganisms that live in the hot springs um, and which uh, do not use the sun uh, as a source of energy. So most life on earth, um, including the algae that live in the oceans, the plants on the land, they get their energy from the sun. And then other animals consume that and therefore their energy also comes from the sun. But with these um, microorganisms that live in Yellowstone hot springs, they get their energy from chemical, um, from chemicals, um, including things like uh, hydrogen gas, uh, uh, sulfuric acid, um, other chemicals like that. And so that's what I was focused on was, okay, do these organisms utilize hydrogen as a form of energy? Um, and that kind of ties, it, it broadly ties into what I am now working on as a post PhD, but not quite my own, of <laughs> running my own lab yet as a postdoctoral scientist. Um, and I am investigating uh, microorganisms and their metabolisms. And in particular, I'm interested in looking at organisms that live um, in the subsurface and the marine subsurface. And those organisms do not have access, of course, to the sun because they're buried under layers of sediment and they're under several hundreds or thousands of feet of ocean. Um, and so they also get their energy from chemicals. And so that's what I'm focused on. Um, okay, well, let me, let me unpack a little of that. That's yeah. very interesting because we, we have a regular show about hydrogen and we care about hydrogen. We, we think that hydrogen is um, you know, a fuel of the future, so to speak. Um, lots of positive things about hydrogen. Yes. And you're actually dealing with um, with uh, with animals that use hydrogen uh, for energy. That's so interesting. So what what is the chemical process involved? Have you studied exactly what biochemical processes are taking place? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there are there are two options for a, a microbe with hydrogen. It can either uh, use hydrogen as a form of energy, or it can produce hydrogen as sort of a waste product. And a lot of the hydrogen that I think we think about in terms of, oh, this is going to be a new biofuel or a new fuel that's going to, you know, be a clean um, source of energy, cleaner source of energy, that, that is um, from microorganisms fermenting a product and then producing hydrogen that way. Um, however, there are also microorganisms that can uh, utilize hydrogen for energy. Um, and so they, they intake hydrogen, they use it up instead of producing it. And um, it, it was thought that um, the usage of hydrogen as a form of energy for microbes is one of the earliest evolving metabolisms on planet Earth. It's um, an easily accessible um, metabolism. Uh, hydrogen was present um, on early Earth. And so it's thought maybe that's a cool link to the past kind of. And so that's kind of why I was interested in it. Um, but it's definitely a two-way street. They can either produce it or use it. Yeah. Okay, producing it. How how do they, this is very interesting, really. How do they produce it? What What is the chemical, biochemical process by which they produce the hydrogen? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not really an expert in all the ways that um, uh, microorganisms can produce hydrogen, but it's it's sort of a it's 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 a, in a process called fermentation. So if you think of like oh if you think fermentation, you might think of say yeast in in your bread. Uh, it takes the um, starches or the sugars in that uh, mixture, and mm -hmm. then it uh, consumes them, and then it uses it breaks those chemical bonds of those energetic molecules such as sugar. Um, but then what what it ex what it uh, then results in is you have all of these different um, other molecules uh, such as water or uh, carbon dioxide that it then needs to get rid of because that they, they can no longer use it. It's not this energetic form of sugar <laughs> that it had before. Right. Um, and so one of those products is hydrogen. Um, oh yeah, so, uh, so theoretically then, man, maybe this is really happening. Theoretically, I could have a bunch of these microbes mm -hmm. uh, and I could feed them whatever they need at a microbe level. 
yeah. they don't need that much. And, and they could generate hydrogen for me and yeah. I could use that hydrogen. I could put that in a tank. Oh, I yeah. could use it for fuel cells. I could have it run my electric hydrogen vehicle. Um, mm -hmm. I could have it run my generator station if I had enough of it, yeah. Yeah, theoretically. Yeah, I, I am definitely not an expert in, in the production of hydrogen, but that, that is, I think, the goal of many of these uh, research projects is to get to a point with these uh, microbes in a bioreactor, these giant tanks, and to be able to produce useful fuels such as methane or hydrogen as well. Yeah. Okay, and what about the other side of it, the microbes that use the hydrogen? What do they use it for? Their, their own metabolism? I mean, is there anything we can learn from what those microbes are doing that would help us, that would help us medically, you know, in our bodies, that would help us mechanically in, in anything that humanity likes to do, uh, where we, we don't have a solution, but this would be a better solution? Yeah, so I'm trying to, so the reason why I, I was really excited about microbes that can utilize hydrogen, as I mentioned briefly before, it's, it's uh, the utilization of hydrogen is something that that metabolism can be uh, sort of hypothesized to be one of the earliest metabolisms on planet Earth. Um, it's a very low energy uh, metabolism. They don't need a lot of energy to then um, consume this or they don't yeah, they, they, it doesn't take a lot for them to utilize this compound. And so it was really easy for the first forms of life on Earth to potentially be using these metabolisms. And so that's why I'm really interested in it. I, I don't know um, if at the moment <laughs> there's anything to be said for like uh, within human health or anything like that, but just, and on a general knowledge sort of scale and, and looking at early Earth or even in potentially extraterrestrial environments and other extreme mm. environments, it could be mm. a really interesting way of looking for um, microbes there. Yeah. Okay, I was telling you before the show that we had a, a woman on ThinkTech a couple of years ago who was, uh, interestingly enough, a lawyer and a geologist. And she told, she taught, she told us about manganese nodules. Mm. <laughs> and she pointed out that manganese nodules were quite valuable. And that in fact, once uh, the international maritime community sorted it out, uh, this would be a, a, real, a real rush um, by various nations to mine manganese nodules, hopefully not disturbing the environment, um, and, and put them on a commercial market. Uh, and they, manganese nodules, are on the surface, the floor, the, the ocean bottom. Um, and that's where, you know, all of that, the manganese nodules is happening. But at the Bigelow Institute, you're not doing that. You're going below the floor of the ocean and you're looking for other things. So what are you looking for? Why are you looking for it? And how do you actually find it? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I just came into this position um, at Bigelow. I'm, I'm a really new, I'm a pretty new postdoc. Um, and so I'm, I'm definitely not <laughs> that well versed in everything that people are doing. Um, but I do have some sense of, of what, and, and I was very fortunate to be able to go on an expedition um, to the Pacific Ocean uh, last year. So right now I live in Maine, um, but uh, we went off of the coast of Oregon uh, to the Juan de Fuca plate, uh, kind of that junction there, so off the coast of Washington. And so um, these two images that are showing up now are of the uh, remotely operated vehicle Jason. Um, and so that is hanging off of the side of uh, the uh, research vessel Atlantis. And so that is what we use, we can use to go down to the bottom of the ocean because uh, you, you need a lot of specialized equipment to go down 2,600 um, meters <laughs> or feet to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so, well, the research that I have been involved with and that I'm hoping to be, <laughs> to, to continue to be involved with despite recent challenges due to COVID is looking at the organisms that live in the largest aquifer on earth, which is the uh, marine subsurface. And so the- When you say aquifer, you mean water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's water under the water. Yeah, exactly. Well, we didn't um, know that until now, Melody. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's and it's hard for me to think about it too. Um, but but my the the um senior research scientist that I'm working with at Bigelow, 
uh, is is has a good way of putting it, and I'll just I'll try to expound on it here. But the um, the volume of Earth's oceans will cycle through this aquifer of water in the crust of the ocean, and it's these you know very small pockets of water that down to the minuscule to very large, um, and it's it's this really large aquifer. But in that aquifer of the subsurface um, is the largest <laughs> um, environment, uh, subsurface environment, because the uh, world's oceans cover about 70% of the earth and to go underneath it, we don't know a whole lot about it. And the only way we can study it is by taking these uh, remote operated vehicles or human occupied submersibles uh, down to the bottom. Yeah. Wow, very exciting to hear about that. So is the, the, the aquifer, is it connected around the earth or is, is it only in pockets in some places? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. And so basically I, I don't have an answer because we don't know enough about it. We know more about the surface of the moon than we do the surface <laughs> of the ocean on earth. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and how deep is it? I mean, I mean, or how deep could it be? Uh, so let's assume that the, uh, let's assume that the floor you're working on, and I know it differs in from place to place, mm -hmm. is like 2,500 meters below, okay, the surface yeah. of the ocean. Let's assume that. How, how, how much further do you have to go down to hit the aquifer? Um, so there are some places where you have to go a couple of feet, and there are some places where you'll have to drill through um, sediment that's been accumulating for eons, millions and millions of years, um, and then so you'll drill through, you know, several hundred feet of sediment, and then you'll have to drill through another 700 feet of rock. Um, so it ranges from, you know, thousands of feet to very little. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And when you get there, how deep could it be or shallow? Um, that I do not have an answer there. A uh, geophysicist would have a much better idea. It's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> you get all these research ships right now. I mean, this is, I know you just started doing your postdoc in Maine at the Bigelow Institute. So you get on the research ships. What is the role of the young scientist, may I say, uh, who is on a ship like that? <clears throat> what, what, what chores, what tasks, what questions are put to you? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, um, and this may not be reflective of every single ship, but I have so far kind of had like one and a half experiences. I, I, I say half very lightly. I was, um, the, I'll talk about the first one, which I was fortunate last year to go on a three week expedition again to uh, the Pacific Ocean right off the coast of Washington. And that was on the research vessel Atlantis. And that was uh, part of a much larger project um, that, that was funded um, or that funded the ship to go. And so I played a, a minor role and I was just trying to get my project done and you know maybe help out some other people. Um, but I was just basically like kind of concentrated in my one little area being like, oh, okay, I need this, I need this, thank you. All right, cool. <laughs> um, but there are you know entire expeditions which are led by uh, some really awesome people, including uh, the scientists I work uh, with, one of the scientists I work with here at Bigelow, and she was leading the whole expedition. So she, you know, she she's, <laughs> um, was uh, organizing everything, um, kind of leading a bunch of the science happening on this whole um, boat, but as a uh, kind of a um, getting a more younger <laughs> um, postdoc, I was just kind of focused on my own project. Uh, which, I is, say, which is what? Yeah, so I'm. Uh, we we were we were out there um, for three weeks, and yeah, my project um, is basically developing new methods of measuring microbial activity. So, how much uh, oxygen is a microbe using, or how much CO two is a microbe using? Um, we want to know how much nutrient turnover is occurring in these understudied environments such as the deep subsurface because uh, we, we don't know what's happening and how do those um, metabolisms and how does that geochemical turnover impact you know the world's oceans which is a huge environment uh, we we would like to have a better idea of that and that's what i'm working on now is new methods to measure activities it's funny uh, your brother uh, uh, christopher who is just uh, about to start uh, an astronomy program in, uh, I guess it's a PhD program, mm, yeah, get that yeah. right, in, in Yale. 
he's he's looking at the stars, <laughs> and, but his sister is looking, um, you know, at the bottom of the ocean. It's, it's a, the opposite direction, Melody. Yeah. Do you guys, do you guys flip a coin one day early on and decide <laughs> that Chris was going to go up and you were going to go down or vice versa? I, I, so I originally started by looking up. Um, I was fortunate to get an REU, an NSF REU, a research experience for undergrads. I got that in my sophomore year um, at my undergrad institution, which was Princeton. And I did that for a summer and I spent the whole summer in like a darkened room on a computer. And I was like, I don't know if this is for me. <laughs> um, and so, uh, I was all then fortunate enough to work with um, an astrobiologist or geomicrobiologist at Princeton who was doing field work and he, he was working on um, subsurface microbes that live in terrestrial mines. And I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing. I can still kind of do this astrobiology related um, research, but not have to, you know, I can go out to the site and, you know, dig up the microbes myself and go sampling and <laughs> and the yeah, field work was definitely more my uh, my uh, speed than than a str strict yeah. astronomy. Which uh, there's, I'm glad he's doing it. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, bro. Um, but there's a lot of computer work, which is yeah. <laughs> so have you have you settled down now? You're definitely a an ocean person, a, a researcher who will it will dwell at at the bottom and below the bottom of the ocean. Is that can we say that that will be your research scientific research career? I mean, I think overall, like I mentioned, I, I had been working, I did a little bit of work in undergrad uh, with a professor in the South African mines, which are on land. And then for my PhD, I worked um, on microbes in Yellowstone and also the Great Salt Lake. Um, but now I'm hopefully going to work with uh, microbes from the bottom of the ocean or below or other ocean environments, um, or at least ways to measure their activity. Um, so my interest, I think, lie heavily in astrobiology related. Um, it doesn't matter if it's beneath the water or beneath the land or on top of the land. <laughs> That's what I'm interested in. It's microbes. <laughs> yeah, it's microbes in general. Yeah. Okay, well, microbes and, and biochemistry is really mm, there together. And um, of course, biochemistry and um, disease and, and COVID-19 and the like, they're close to each other too, in terms of you know, their, their mechanics. And um, I wonder if, uh, you know, that's something that you're interested in. In other words, finding the link between something you're studying about microbes and something that, that is going to be relevant, increasingly so, in, in viruses today. Do you think about that? Is, is that a possible connection for you? Yeah, um, for, for sure. And, and the real, what I think about is, how I think about that is that we just don't know a whole lot about these difficult to access extreme environments. Um, like there, there's um, so much we could learn from that, whether it's you know new biomedical advances. And just in this example, um, if you ever if you've ever heard of a uh, TAC polymerase, uh, that is used in a molecular technique pretty much in any um, biomedical facility. If you want to be able to test for COVID-19, for example, you're going to take the swab, you're going to sequence what's on that swab in order to say, oh, is this COVID or is it not COVID? Um, and to do that, you need an enzyme called TAC polymerase. Well, TAC polymerase, um, and that will replicate the uh, DNA sequence or RNA sequence um, after it's been converted to DNA, um, that will replicate sequences enough so that you can tell, oh yeah, that sequence was present. And yes, you do, you did have COVID. Um, but that TAC polymerase, that enzyme was originally isolated from a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. Um, so if there hadn't been this, you know, bio biological um, micro microbial focus in the environment, then that um, innovation would not have been possible. And so it's all linked together and you know maybe that that kind of finding will only come around once every so often. But um, those mic the, the health <laughs> side of microbiology as well as the environmental side of microbiology will always be intertwined in that way. Yeah. Are you, are you familiar with uh, Dr. Dave Carl, Professor Dave Carl at the uh, the Seymour organization mm -hmm. in microbial oceanography? Yes. Uh, at yeah. UH. 
I've definitely um, heard of him. I've read a couple of his papers, but I'm new to the ocean, so it's. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, well, he he is the intersection, right, between yeah. microbial and oceanography. That's what he does, yeah. and he's been running this thing called uh, Station Aloha um, for mm -hmm. many many years. Uh, where they go out on a ship. Uh, and they and take samples of the water and the like and determine the microbial content. Reason I ask is that there is some action going on here in Hawaii in uh, the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology um, that is relevant to your work. And I guess the question I want to ask you, Melody, is uh, what are the chances of you coming back here after you finish your postdoc work in, in Maine or in California, wherever it might be, um, and bringing, bringing some of that research back home here? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a tough job market for academics, and it it was a tough job market, and it is going to be an even tougher job market now. There's a lot of hiring freezes happening, and a lot of people are kind of, you know, since they're not hiring now, they're going to be competing later on. And so, um, I'm I I hope to work in an environment as cool as Hawaii. Like Hawaii has so many opportunities, especially for oceanography, um, but it really will depend on if I can get a job or not. <laughs> but what about what about medical schools? I mean, for example, <clears throat> you know, there's research going on in the, in the John A. Burns School of Medicine and the Cancer Research Center, uh, which I have seen some of it, and it's very impressive uh, right here. I mean, could your interest and your experience here, in, you know, in school and in Maine, um, could they get you a job in a medical school, in a, in a medical research facility, or uh, in this case, a cancer research facility? Um, I, I think it would depend on what the what the job was. I I at this point, I'm pretty well enmeshed in the astrobiology, you know, environmental microbiology side. <laughs> um, but I'll never say never. You know, you never know what what can happen in someone's career, and it could be, you know some sample that I have might have an incredible value to <laughs> something in the medical field and and that's how that happens or just eventually I you know have a new project with collaborators in um, schools of medicine and we work together on a project and that would be amazing too but yes yeah, at this point as a <laughs> as a postdoc it would be hard to tell <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean but you know <clears throat> there's a whole philosophy involved isn't there I mean, you're in science, you have your mainstream of, of research activity, but you have to be flexible, you have to be oh, yeah. nimble, you have to look for opportunities, uh, you have to write your stuff up so yeah. that people can see what you're doing and you can, you know, have a curriculum vitae that makes some sense to, you know, some other research facility. Mm -hmm. uh, this takes me to a question. I was holding back on this question till the right time, and I think it, it's the right time. Thank you to the viewer who left this question with us. And I, and I read the question. What is Dr. Lindsay's prediction for science careers for future American students when the president doesn't seem, hmm, I like this question, when the president doesn't seem to respect uh, our leading scientists? Okay, that's, yeah. that, that's, that doesn't intimidate you. You can answer that question, right? Yeah, well, I, I mean, there, there, there is a, there is a disconnect between the president and any, any science, unfortunately, which should not be the case. He can't even listen to his own advisors when, it, when it comes to it. Um, I don't know if I have a prediction about students. I think you know, COVID is limiting, and and the actions therein is is limiting students at this point. A lot of students are not going to go. Um, back for on on in-person teaching, um, they're going to be limited in their career, You're not limited in career options, but it's going to, for me personally, it, it might, it's going to be difficult. So I'm just projecting that onto them. Um, but my hope is that, you know, if you go out and vote, maybe we'll have some better policy makers. Um, and that will definitely um, improve education and science overall, especially, yeah. Especially considering. Well, yeah, but I want to walk that back a little bit uh, to ask you about the scientific community in general. Mm -hmm. How do they feel? How, how, you know, you've been in school for pretty much all of this Trump administration, and you've been walking and talking with people and, um, you know, trying to get 
get an understanding of where this administration is going. Um, how, how do people feel about this? You've, you've rubbed elbows with a ton of scientists. Um, how, do, how does the science community feel about it? There must be a reaction of some kind. What is it? Um, horror would be, would be the reaction. It's just um, at every turn, it's, it's pretty much disbelief. And I'm, I'm speaking personally here, <laughs> not, not on behalf of anyone else. It's, it's just, I, I cannot believe this is what is actually happening. I cannot believe this funding is getting cut to this, you know, to the pandemic response team or, you know, to healthcare. It's the same, it's the same reaction. It's, it's, I, I, it's, it's almost, you know, inhumane what's, what's happening on all fronts and not just science, but definitely from a science point of view. <laughs> yeah. are, are we losing talent? Is, yes. is the country losing talent? You know, people who can't get jobs, can't get funding, and so they, they go and do something else? I would, I would say most likely. I, I can't think of anyone personally, um, but, you know, even, even with, with um, you know, especially under this administration, but even before that, um, things like, you know, systemic racism are definitely limiting the diversity in science and that is is cutting our you know um, the 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 things that we could achieve as you know as humans and as a society and the the administration is definitely not helping with that at all yeah yeah and then just a just a, a, a short distance away is the whole question of the environment i mean a part of your motivation must be an envir environmental motivation because your research is environmental, mm -hmm. um, I think. Yeah. And um, and so the question I ask you is what what about the what about the group that wants to save the environment, save the planet? I mean, we were not involved uh, in 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 the COP uh, the COP conferences over the past over the Trump years. Um, we have not collaborated with other scientists and activists around the world in dealing with climate change. Um, and here we are. And I wonder, you know, from your point of view in school and undergraduate, graduate, and now, um, uh, you know, are we losing momentum uh, in dealing with climate change? Are we losing momentum in, in, in training people to do environmental research? Um, I, I, I feel like if on a non-funding level, it is not losing momentum. If anything, <laughs> it's it's kind of encouraging people to to speak up more and hopefully vote more <laughs> um, for policymakers that will actually listen to scientists and and hopefully improve the future for all life on the planet. Um, but in terms of you know things like EPA funding getting cut, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna cause some people to be like, oh well, if I can't put in a proposal. To, to this particular work on, you know, water health or you know, anything like that, then um, they're not, they're gonna turn their attention to other research projects and that really important work on, you know, environmental protection and human health and planetary health is going to get lost mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, very troubling because if you, if you don't do any work in that area, then we, we don't have as robust in it a response to climate change, then climate change becomes all the more threatening. That's, yeah. I think that's where we are. That's so the, what about Hawaii, Millie? You know, so I hope you can come back to Hawaii, but it sounds like it's not a sure thing. Um, and uh, Hawaii could be a great place for you. Uh, we do have an ocean, by the way, if I hadn't mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, I'm on the other <laughs> ocean right now. <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean is right there on my door. So does Hawaii have a value on science? I mean, I, I really wonder about that sometimes. Um, there have been in indications over the years that I've watched to say that state government doesn't really care that much about science or technology. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there's enough of a, uh, I call it a cloth mother back here that would be a welcoming, a welcoming, um, uh, encouraging uh, environment, a political environment for you to come and, and be invested in science in Hawaii? Yeah, I, I think that that Hawaiian oceanography in particular have always had 
a good relationship. Um, not, you know, and other, I know I watched two shows with my brother and I, the, the, the 30 meter telescope and <laughs> all that discussion. But in particular with, with ocean health and, and oceanography and that, and more of the you know, direct field that that represents to Hawaii, uh, I think the state government and um, the policymakers are always kind of have that as a as a something that they would like to support and fund. That's the sense I get, but I I am not an expert in that. <laughs> no, but you're you're from Hawaii and you've lived yeah. here most of your life, uh, at least before before school. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I I just uh, wonder how you feel about you know coming home to Hawaii when uh, there's there are issues about its support uh, of science. So you know, if you come back or when you come back, what would your what would your plan be? I mean, let me ask you it this way: What is your plan from this point forward to you know to develop uh, and build your career in science? And remember too that um, we should talk about science as an element of diversification in Hawaii. So it's a moving target. Uh, hopefully, there'll be visionary people in Hawaii who will see that we need to diversify our economy. And one of the obvious ways to do that is in science and technology. But what is your plan? Um, and what, what are the influences on your plan? The, call it the, um, uh, the variables that you would consider going forward. Yeah, um, I, I think so. So my, my personal goal is kind of like a job interview now, and not really, but kind of. Um, but where, where I see myself in you know, five to 10 years, hopefully, is I, I want to be able to run my own lab. I want to be able to um, do really cool and interesting, innovative research um, on these like kind of extreme environments and uh, you know, bottom of the ocean, within the ocean, above the ocean, <laughs> any, any of those. And so a lot of that um, does interact with um, kind of the government agencies of like the NSF, National Science Foundation, or NASA, um, or other, um, N N N N or, uh, uh, NOAA, and those kinds of funding agencies, maybe even Department of Energy. Um, so that would be an important thing to consider is how those agencies are funding science and hopefully i can get you know the experience and the knowledge enough to apply for those kinds of funding um but then once that happens then then the goal is to be able to kind of do research that you want to do and and a lot of the times that's going to involve the low at the local level and so you know if hopefully i could get a job um that will allow me to pr put forward propos proposals for funding. But then even if I'm not in Hawaii, it's at the national level and you can you could be like, oh, okay, I have this money to go answer the question of this microbe is doing what, where. Um, and that can really be anywhere in the world as long as you follow the you know the Goya protocols and all that. Um, but it, in, if it's in the same country, so Hawaii is in the same country, so you can kind of take your research and apply it to anywhere you want you you I would want to do research, and that could include Hawaii, of course. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Well, that's why Hawaii has to take this uh, opportunity um, to build a scientific sector, a body of people and knowledge, of institutional knowledge, so that it can compete on a global level. Otherwise, um, if if you're interested in a given science, and there are 27 places, all of which are not Hawaii. And those are the places competing for your attention. Those are the places that are offering you the jobs. So Hawaii has to be very conscious of this and, and it has to you know, compete. It has to build, it has to build a reputation. Am I right about this? Otherwise it falls yeah. behind environment or no environment. I mean, it's a two way street too, especially with field scientists. Like we wanna go where there's cool environments, um, but we also really want to involve the local community and what we do. And so to bring those, you know, dollars of funding, I guess, to important questions, but also those that are going to, you know, help the community in some way, or at least inform the community about the, the natural world that they live in, 
is very important. And so it definitely is this kind of two way street and it would be great to be able to get a job in Hawaii, but also it would be with the goal that I would also be, you know, not giving back, so to speak, but, but not doing this helicopter science and just like coming in, landing and flying away right. with all this knowledge. I would want to involve um, people, local people and, you know, people of all different cultures and see how that could, how that knowledge could improve um, humanity as a whole, hopefully, and the future for <laughs> all life. <laughs> one, one, one last question, Melody, and that is uh, this. Um, there are a lot of kids out there in school they may get to see this this tape, um, and <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and um, you know, I think it's important for you to tell them what you think about what they should be doing and thinking about in terms of uh, developing, uh, you know, uh, investing in investing their time and academic energy in science. Uh, is it worthwhile these days? Um, how important is it? What should they be thinking about and doing um, to, you know, express that desire? Yeah, um, so not to sit on my ivory tower and be like, science is the best, you should only do science, but you should really, you know, think about what interests, what interests you as a student. Like, is, is it going to be science? Is it going to be, um, you know, social science? Is it going to be education? Um, how can you I think it's very important to think of how you can use your personal talents to help the world. And right now, science is very important. <laughs> um, it is one of the things that is going to improve life uh, for, our, um, for everyone on the planet, hopefully, in, in terms of climate change and public health. Um, but there, you know, there are other ways to, to get into, you know, use your talents as well. So whatever that may be, a science is a great option. Um, I encourage you to reach out to you know, your teachers or to professors at the local college. They would love to have a student come and be like, hey, I'm interested in what you do. Like, can you, you know, tell me what you do or, you know, something like that. Like, I would love that for anybody to contact me and be like, hey, I want to hear more about like what you do and how you got there and what could I possibly do to, <laughs> to do that. And so, so long story short, I guess it's, it's do what you love, first of all, <laughs> um, but think about how that might, you know, help, help everybody. Um, that's an important thing in this day and age where we all need to care for each other. Um, and then thirdly, you know, reach out to scientists. They're, they love, they, you know, we, we sit at our desks and in our labs and we're all alone all the time. So, so reach out because we love having students. I'm really sad that this summer I couldn't have a student in the lab because of coronavirus. And so, yeah, student, reach out to people. <laughs> So All right, Melody. I, go ahead. Go ahead. No, just, yeah, reach out to scientists. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> All right, Melody Lindsay, thank you so much for coming around. Thank you for talking to us about your career, your aspirations, and your science. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs>